go to desktop. And let me use this. Hang on a second while I just get my app together. There we are. And play. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so so um, th this, this round table, what could we do to enhance our exploration of the periodic table? Was driven a little bit in part by discussions that Rajiv and I and Laura and uh, uh, JC Paglioni had as we have tried to put together uh, a proposal to the NSF for an accelerated network of research in material physics. Um, uh, most likely uh, that proposal will come bounce back at us another time and we're going to send it in a third time. And so input from this will be of direct interest to us. Um, uh, so this is what I wanted just to think. First of all, exploration requires good maps. And uh, uh, this community doesn't need to be reminded about the vastness of the periodic table. But in a way, an analogy you can make is uh, the exploration of the ancient mariners across the world. Um, they needed good maps. And uh, it was a remarkable thing that the Europeans, who in many ways had the most primitive uh, society in the uh, uh, late Middle Ages were the ones that actually started doing exploration of the world. Um, and it was a confluence of many factors. But one important thing was the arrival of excellent maps from the Islamic world uh, that made it possible, and also technology that made it possible to deal with the ocean currents. Uh, ancient mariners uh, uh, were, were always afraid of uh, sailing with the wind because they worried that they'd never be able to get back again. And so until that was mastered, you couldn't cross the Atlantic. Um, and they eventually discovered the trade winds. And once they discovered the trade winds, they could start sailing across the Atlantic. And uh, this map on the left-hand side is one of the early maps that was made by the Europeans as they discovered the edge of South and North uh, uh, America. They didn't know how wide it was. Um, they thought it was quite narrow in those days, um, but later it, it became clear that it was actually a much wider continent than they imagined. Uh, but of course, as you know, their initial motivation was to uh, discover a new route to Asia, uh, which continued for a very long time with the Northwest Passage and lots of wasted effort. Anyway, so in some sense, there are parallels with the exploration of the, of the periodic table. The periodic table itself has been evolving with time. And when Mendeleev first proposed it uh, to help his students understand chemistry, it was a simpler periodic table than we have today. And this is one of the early periodic tables he put together uh, with, with the periods that of course we now know have their origins in the shell structure of atoms. Uh, but this has provided guidance. Today's periodic table is more complex and, and it also uh, doesn't really tell the story because this is a two-dimensional plot. But of course, as we uh, know, once we start to make different compounds, it becomes multidimensional. And so at each level, as we go up in compounds, we, we add in perhaps another factor of 100. So it scales, the number of compounds scales exponentially with the number of compounds you add to your crystal. And we need maps to help us figure out, well, what direction should we sail? And of course, uh, some maps uh, involve reorganizing the periodic table. This is a plot uh, due to Kometko and Smith in the early 1980s, where they rearranged the D and F electron uh, rows in order to emphasize the transition from localized to delocalized behavior. Uh, and as you go from the delocalized uh, behavior down here with the, 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 five, the five Ds being the most delocalized across to the most localized, or Fs, you of course have this fascinating transition. And it's actually true that many interesting compounds, cerium, iron, uh, 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 lie at this transition. And it led an idea that we should look for materials in which we're on the brink of magnetism, okay? So we need new uh, guiding principles <coughs> uh, to help us explore things. The other thing I, I wanted that, that, that Nick uh, Currow reminded me of, of, of was the importance of uh, new concepts. This is a picture of uh, Bill Shockley. Uh, uh, and he discovered in 1939 that when you cross orbitals across, you get edge states. 
Uh, this is his 1D model. And he even speculated that it might apply to diamond. But he was, he was lacking uh, some concepts. Uh, he didn't have the topological concept. And it took more than half a century more to discover the other class of insulators, band insulators, topological insulators. Why did it take so long? And could we have accelerated it? Okay. In 1973, Ernst Bucher and collaborators at Bell Labs um, did a study of, your, of, of, uh, of magnetic beryllium-13 compounds, cerium beryllium-13 and uranium beryllium-13, and they discovered that uranium beryllium-13 went superconducting at one Kelvin. You can read about it in the FISREV B they published. He never discussed it with his colleagues at Bell Labs. They never knew it was going on. Uh, and uh, a, a discovery of this superconductor, this heavy fermion superconductor, was delayed by an entire decade because of a misconception based on conventional superconductors that magnetic moments are bad for superconductivity. And they really are if you have conventional superconductors. But it turns out for anomalous superconductors, they're good. Um, uh, and uh, uh, in the 1980s, Claude Michel and Bernard Raveau in Paris studied perovskites. They had samples which, when they later looked at them, were superconducting, uh, but they didn't cool them to nitrogen or helium temperatures to search for high TC because everybody knew that superconductivity uh, didn't occur in these kinds of materials. Um, and so misconceptions can, uh, can send us in the wrong direction, and we have to have an open mind uh, to explore the periodic table. Okay, and so how can we accelerate the theory experiment exchange? There's a question to you all, okay? And pretty much my last point here is that replicating failure, how can we avoid it? Physicists publish success, uh, but never failure. We don't get any uh, awards uh, for failure unless, of course, perhaps the Ig Nobel Prize is the only prize that uh, rewards uh, uh, anomalous or, or adventurous work uh, that didn't lead to anything of, of great measure, but is perhaps interesting. And, and so this leads to a multiple replication of dead ends, which we never hear about. But uh, it's going on. Uh, graduate students across the world are repeating the errors that other graduate students have made uh, uh, because there was no record that doing this particular prescription uh, was a bad thing okay and uh so um uh and precise recipes i'm a theorist but i don't believe that precise recipes for material synthesis are always available for example uh, nick didn't mention the fact that when he does uranium ditelluride you have to have what is it an excess of tellurium to get superconducting samples these things are very important this was a very important issue with cerium copper two silicon two having a, a slight copper excess if i remember to make it go superconducting and so uh, this motivates us thinking that maybe we need a, an archive like database for materials research um nick has a point to make he's raised his hand yeah um i i agree with you um sort of because it's a complicated issue not just with respect to ut too um one thing, of course, is is this uh, concept of uh, you know keeping something secret to oneself so that others can't just jump ahead and do things. Uh, that's mm -hmm. a social problem. Mm -hmm. There's a second one, and that is um, that even if one were to publish the exact details, um, other groups might not be able to reproduce them using those exact um, details. Just like if you're baking a cake. At elevation or something like that. It yeah, could, no. So that then you need to learn what the differences are and uh, all. Yeah, the and, and you have to incentivize it. Right? Yep, I agree. So, and I think I'm going to hand over to Nick, uh, who made these slides. Nick Curro. Nick, take over. Yeah. See. So. So. Uh, yeah. This is Nick C. <laughs> um, yeah. So I guess I I was, I I was thinking about when I was a um. When I was at Los Alamos and um, at the peak of the 115 uh, discoveries, and I heard um, John Terrell give a talk about his uh, his progress of discovery in, in 115s and sort of talking about his thoughts about how how to grow new materials. For example, substituting the um, the uh, rhodium or iridium or cobalt 
uh, or maybe replacing with plutonium in, in, instead of cerium. And, and um, so um, just trying to think of other analogies and, and trying to classify some of the uh, materials that um, we have found uh, exciting superconductivity in, and, and what, what are kind of the motivating factors for the discoveries. And so um, I think uh, you can kind of classify these into sort of what I would say adiabatic extensions would be like, for example, in the heavy fermions, you generally have a, the same structure, but you can replace uh, some sort of spectator atoms and, and get new, uh, new variations and new superconductors this way. And this has been really, really fruitful for studying you know, for example, quantum criticality and, and, and so on. Um, but then there's some sort of like unpredictable first order serendipitous discoveries. For example, in the, um, you know, I know after the high TC materials were discovered, there was a, um, a lot of ideas that maybe you, you could find superconductivities in, in other 3D uh, metals. Um, and it was a lot of struggles for that, but it was very hard uh, and, and but now we have you know iron, nickel, chromium, ruthenium, um, and, and uh, uh, but in 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 many of these cases, there's been really vastly different structures and and and, and new ideas that have come out. Um, but I don't know how to. I don't think there was like some sort of concerted effort to try to to do that uh, by changing the uh, um, you know to, to find this. It was just kind of a, a, a lucky thing. Same sort of thing with graphene. Um, um, and and um, so, so anyway, th this was just kind of some, some ideas I, I had. Um, in, in thinking about what, what can we do to, to, to accelerate um, discoveries with a periodic table, I was, I had some thoughts about what, what for example, what, what, is, what is limiting us now? I mean, is it that we just don't have enough people to, to grow materials and characterize them? Um, is it because we don't have enough, uh, we, we, have, we have ignorance about a phase diagrams, of binary phase diagrams, or do we not know how to uh, understand the, you know, what, what, what structures might we want to change to get some sort of new functionality? Um, I don't know. Um, uh, Another area, which I, I honestly don't know, um, but um, uh, it seems that we, we don't really, I, I've always wondered why we don't have a sort of a more um, uh, simple model or, or, or understanding of, of how, how, um, how crystals grow and, 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 and binary phase diagrams are, are, are made uh, or, or are determined. You know, we have really elegant ways of calculating band structures, for example, but we, you know, do we, we don't really have a systematic model to understand um, crystal growth. And so, so, I mean, why, for example, do we have, you know, some, some materials, when you try to grow uh, new crystals, uh, or you try to dope some crystals, the, the crystals get smaller and smaller and smaller, and then you, you can't, they're no longer stable. So I, I don't, I'm not sure if we have a fundamental understanding why. It just seems to me as like some sort of um, black magic chemistry that works. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and, and then, uh, so, so uh, you know, is it, is it, is it um, if, if we want to explore the periodic table, is it, is it a better approach to, you know, take the kind of idea where you, you, you know one structure works and, or is interesting and you just want to explore adiabatically away from that by changing uh, by substituting some some element in, or or is it better just to, you know, have a, a huge effort growing all kinds of different materials and and, and not may, maybe focusing more effort on, on on discovering new materials and, and not so much in, in detail. Um, I I don't know which would, would be better. Um, and then um, you know another area which I I I always thought was intriguing is the idea that um, uh, to synthesize materials at, at high pressure. Um, there are, you know, that opens up an, a whole other uh, direction in, in sort of materials phase space. Um, so, and then, and then um, the, the, I also want, oh, yeah, there we go. Um, yes, so, 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 um, you know, there's a lot of 
recent excitement about machine learning for, for uh, and this kind of builds on the idea of the database that Pierce was just talking about. I mean, if we have a, a rich database of materials and we have um, presumably the right uh, algorithms, we could have a, a computer try to identify important trends. And so on the right is this uh, um, hill plot also from, uh, from uh, Jim Smith. And, um, but, but there's this idea that there's a correlation between, uh, for example, the, the spacing between uranium atoms and uranium compounds, the uranium uranium spacing, and whether it becomes superconducting or is antiferromagnetic. And so this is actually a correlation that was observed experimentally by, by, by people. And, and um, but I mean, uh, perhaps there's more, uh, there's some other underlying fu more fundamental concept like some combination of angles and spacing, which is actually more important for or determining what, the ground state of a material. And perhaps a, a computer could identify those correlations better than we could. Um, so, I mean, it's not clear if that's true or not. Um, but one thing I wanted just to point out, um, my colleague, uh, Valentin Tafor has, has um, worked on, on pre preparing a, a, a database of, of, of um, magnetic materials. And, so, for example, on the on the on the bottom right, you can see some um, relationship among um, uh, different cobalt compounds. And so, uh, I mean, I this is this is perhaps a, a you know a, a new tool that we can take advantage of, you know, with uh, machine learning and, and, and these databases to help guide uh, synthesis and discovery of materials. So yeah, that's all I really have. The PC scale really that high? I mean, is that a... So, so that's Curie temperature. <laughs> Curie temperature, okay. So those are just some ideas that we wanted to use just to catalyze some discussion right now. Uh, what, what, what we can do to really help uh, make this exploration run more smoothly. Um, uh, so I can make a comment if you like. Yeah, please. Um, just regarding what it takes and what's needed uh, to discover new materials. So, uh, yeah, I agree, Nick, that, um, you know, it'd be nice to better know the uh, mechanics of crystal formation and so on. People do that. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's more of a phase space problem. You know, it's, um, there's so many parameters in a crystal growth that unless you have a, uh, you know, a huge lab that has everything perfect and you can replicate everything. I mean, you know, it, just as an example, sometimes when we grow materials, every, everything is normally the same, same person, same furnace, same crucibles, and one growth produces crystals and one doesn't. Nobody knows why, but there's some reason why, right? There's some parameter that was not the same, you know, a gust of wind came through or something, I don't know. Um, but the other, more important issue is just the uh, uh, the prestige and the, the reward for doing materials work in physics. Okay, so you know I know lots of chemists and chemists, you know, that do solid state chemistry have one grad student dedicated to each material, and in some sense that's what it takes. You need some person that's dedicated to growing compound X. And they do that for their PhD. You know, it's not, it's not that they you have one postdoc that's working on a whole family of materials and grows this crystal and that crystal and that crystal, and we do experiments on it. So there's a much more concerted effort and a larger effort in actually producing you know, new compounds and so on in solid state chemistry. And you know, some of us are lucky to, to uh, work with these kinds of people to get ideas and to uh, cross fertilize uh, such that we utilize the resources on both sides. And I think that may be one important thing to keep pushing forward, which is to try to facilitate collaborations essentially via funding and, and uh, funding structures that would facilitate this kind of work. But it's the stand, old standing problem also that there's just no glory in uh, in uh, material synthesis for us, you know, you want to get tenure, you want to publish papers, you want, uh, you want to get jobs, you know, it's a tricky, tricky problem. 
So, that, so it's it's burning the candle at both ends. I'm not sure how to how to solve that. Can I have just a word? Go ahead, please, Henri. Yes. <clears throat> well, I I, I think uh, <clears throat> growing new materials uh, is something which is not well defined. Uh, uh, I would like I would prefer to know whether one wants to to grow materials which improve a property, for instance, or to grow materials which discover new properties. So this, if you think in, in one of these directions, I'm, I'm not sure the way to, to synthesize one of these is going to be the, uh, is going to be the same. I, I think one has to, to know what, to, what kind of things one is searching. If you search to improve TC or to to uh, to work on superconductivity uh, or, or to see new superconductivities. At least when I say new superconductivity, it, it, it already means you are searching for new new properties. But uh, in practice, uh, uh, what is very rewarding is to find new properties, and that I don't know whether one can. Uh, uh, how we, one is guided, one can be guided by some feeling. Uh, I don't know. This is this. I want to to to, to differentiate these two kind of uh, orientation. You. Uh, Zilka, uh, you had a comment. Yeah, just to to what what Omri just said. So I I think that the ones who are here, I think everyone would agree that we are up to finding new physics when we try to grow materials, right? I mean, of course, if you are already discovered something, then you work around that discovery point and sort of uh, look a little bit in the neighborhood as uh, Nick said, but, but I mean, the, the main interest I think is to discover something entirely new and then you, you are really, you, you need some intuition where to do something and then, and then it takes immense time. So I think that's really give me 500 people and I can be more productive. But I mean, it's really, that's immense time because I mean, many of these phases are so difficult. They form difficultly and you need to work very carefully to have ultimately a pure phase and characterize everything. It, it kills so many men or women hours that um, you need an army to be more efficient. So I think it is really very, very, very time consuming to do that. and. Um, I don't know whether machine learning can help would be great, but I, <laughs> I'm, I'm not that optimistic. So I think it's really a manpower limitation. I mean, at least in my group, it definitely is. I have many more ideas what to try, but I, I can't because it's slow. Daniel. Yeah, um, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, two points. One, um, I remember in 2009, I, I did a stint on some committee that, that you know, the, the, the solid state sciences committee for the, 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 the uh, NAS, I think it's now called condensed matter physics or something. And, and I remember very clearly it was one of the meetings there that, that the, the, the uh, it was brought up this issue about crystal growers, how, you know, many of them, uh, you know, uh, were from national labs or from, you know, um, you, know, uh, um, you know, industrial labs or places like, you know, Bell. And that as, you know, some of those institutions, you know, began to, you know, break apart. Um, some went to universities, but that as, as uh, um, Nick had said, there is very little glory in, in crystal growth. Um, and, you know, uh, it, there's not as clear a path for you know, academic advancement and that, and that this was seen as an issue and people were wondering then, I remember on the committee, some of the experimentalists, you know, should, should there be more prizes for crystal growth? Is there anything the community could do to, uh, to, um, to, to, to increase the visibility of this very important field? Because you know, without the materials themselves, you know, you know, progress just uh, stops. One, it was also pointed out, I was wondering if anyone could speak to this, that um, in other countries like, uh, you know, China, I think was, was one of the examples that there, there was uh, much more of an emphasis on, on this. 
Um, so I'm wondering if anyone has knowledge about about that. Um, and then the second point was I was surprised, Piers, that you didn't um, mention AI and machine learning more for you know for theoretical searches. That's certainly becoming a a, a big a big deal. Uh, you know, machine learning was uh, that was a big part of the Kavli session at last year's um, uh, March meeting. And mm. it seems that there have been you know some some successes uh, certainly in in finding new topological materials and and uh, some of these are just more, more I, I catalog I, searches. But uh, I was wondering if you could comment on that. Well, I I think we've had a lot of discussion about machine learning on and off through this meeting. And so if you if you've got something where you where you're where you're using the machine to lower yourself, optimize yourself down the funnel as our protein folders describe it, this method works very well. So presumably it would be very good for exploring an existing island of discovery that you already have. Um, but would it be good for jumping to brand new islands, discovering new islands? Um, Nick mentions, uh, uh, Nick meant, I mean, this is, depends on whether machine learning and AI can develop cons sort of, Synthetic concept, conceptual understanding, and, I'm, and maybe it can. Um, uh, Nick didn't mention the fact that in the one one fives, the starting material was cerium indium three, and cerium indium three had been known for twenty years as an antiferromagnet at forty kelvin, but the arrival of the cuprates led people to think, and I think folks like Zachary Fisk and uh, and Gil Lonzerich, that maybe if you put pressure and then you make it more two-dimensional, you'll discover something new. And so that was really the conceptual guidance there that squeezing an antiferromag that would make a superconductor, making it more two-dimensional uh, and then making the hybridization bigger might increase TC. And in fact, it was a very successful program. It first was the discovery of, of, of 0.1 Kelvin TC in serum indium three under pressure. And then the discovery of two Kelvin in the 115 uh, cerium systems, and then 18.5 Kelvin in the plutonium system. In fact, this is the most successful sequence of superconductivity discovery we've ever, ever had, uh, but we haven't been able to replicate it in another family, unfortunately, uh, with higher TCs. So uh, I suppose in a way the, 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 the iron base were another island of discovery around which we've been able to expand. And so making the jump to the new islands, as Zilka said, and as, as, uh, as JP said, we somehow need to make the case for, for more investment in, in, uh, in person power, uh, in prestige for the growers, and, but also connectivity between the growers and those who like to look for patterns. The Mendeleevs of our world need to be harnessed to direct us in the right directions, the Lonsriches and the Mendeleevs. Um, anyway, that's my extended thought on that. But that, I, I suppose I'm one of those old fogies who was a little bit skeptical about machine learning. And then presumably what's gonna happen is in one year or two, Google will announce that they've discovered a new high TC material. Um, that's what mm -hmm. I'm waiting for, uh, for, for alpha, al alpha compound, alpha TC, uh, uh, to take us in those directions. Nick, you're waiting to say something. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, this is probably just a different way of saying um, what has already been said. Um, but we're talking sort of about two different things. Uh, everybody wants novelty. Right? When we say we want materials discovery, um, we will not reward a person who substituted a bunch of different transition metals into a site, you knew you could, maybe there was a good chance you could, and then you get the same property. You're asking basically to, yeah, to jump to islands. And the only way that you find these new things is you let people work on essentially uninteresting or marginally interesting things because the, otherwise it's already predicted. And, and, um, I don't know how you reward that properly, not even with grants, but I mean, I, 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 you got me thinking. So we were sorting March meeting um, correlated abstracts. And I wonder how many people will go and attend a talk from a graduate student who's working on 
generic. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm even using the wrong language, right? You know, but something that's not cerium cobalt indium five. You know, I made something. It's kind of boring. But that's what you need if you're going to discover something new. Yeah, there's tremendous publication bias. I agree. A, you know, a colleague of mine in psychology once told me, you know, there's a lot of news about this uh, issue of uh, re the replicability crisis that started in social psychology. And I was shocked a number of years ago when he he told me that in in, in psychology, even even successful. Uh, you know, uh, provocative, uh, you know, uh, uh, experiments, people, people don't follow up on them because you know, nobody wants to be second. And I thought at least in physics, you know, we have, you know, people will always try to tweak things. If somebody discovers one superconductor, people will, you know, try to, you know, see what happens when you put in, you know, yttrium instead of, you know, some other material. And, and uh, but, but, but as you know, Nick is saying, there's still this issue of, Tremendous issue of publication bias that 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 you know mundane results or failed uh, you know so-called failed uh, you know experiments or failed theoretical investigations you know or just don't really merit much attention in 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 the in the journals. So okay, you have a comment. Yes, yeah, so, so so maybe one one uh, possibility could be to really uh, strengthen the connection to solid state chemists. I mean, because for, for them, it's not the absolute necessity to find a new physical effect. So sometimes to find a new structure is, is very interesting and rewarding for them. And maybe we don't really have enough meetings where we really connect to the chemist, solid state chemist, I don't know. Yeah, I, I agree with that quite strongly. And, and it's, but the problem is there's still a disconnect, right? And, and it's not yeah. just, uh, but different it's not languages. Needed, right? I mean, many of us, the ones who do crystal growth as well, they, they can speak to, I mean, I can speak quite well to chemists. Two of my group members are solid state chemists, but still uh, they are not in the chemistry community. They are in the physics community and still subject to the pressure to find something quickly. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Kanka, you had a point. You're muted, Kanka. Yeah, good. You're muted. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so there are a lot of very good points by the experimentalists. I was wondering, uh, Dan raised some questions about theory, but I'm short of not uh, short of machine learning. I'm thinking what, how can theorists contribute to this whole effort um, of marching uh, or creating new compounds or opening um, or designing new materials? Is there any suggestion on how theory should proceed? And also if younger people coming to do condensed matter theory, how could they be motivated to do this? What kind of rewards they would be looking at in the future? So I'm not clear how theorists can, I mean, we, we are almost always chasing experimentalists, right? Which is fine, it's an experimentally driven science and we work on compounds that experimentalists discover, but how do we, as theorists, can we take some lead role in this entire enterprise. That's not clear to me. Jim. Well, it's a pity that Megan Aronson isn't with us. Um, a few years ago, she got funding for an idea that goes along the lines of what Cotter was asking. Um, um, so she had the idea that now perhaps LDA plus DMFT could be predictive. And so she recruited Gabi Kotliar to uh, work on a, a certain region of space space that she thought would be interesting. And the concept was that they would imagine what if you had such and such a material uh, before she would actually try to grow it, uh, she would ask Gabi, Gabi to you know do a calculation and see whether the theory suggested, even suggested, that it might be interesting. And so her idea was to use uh, the theory as a kind of screening tool before she would invest the effort to actually grow the stuff and make measurements. Um, I, I actually don't know how that played out for her, uh, but uh, Megan might have some real comments about how, how that could work or did work or might be improved for the future uh, if if we had her here to ask, uh, I think the case the case of uh, hydrogen compounds uh, under pressure is a little bit that one. It's 
it's essentially because theoreticians say that under pressure, this would become superconductor, etc., etc., that a big effort has been done with the, the diamond anvil cell uh, to try to, to achieve the, this uh, kind of compound. So in some sense, it's true that one can go that way. That is with an idea uh, uh, coming from theoretical concepts, one can imagine uh, uh, to apply it to some new materials that would fit with the concepts. Okay, but, but for heavy fermions, that's super hard. I would have missed everything. I yeah, studied during course. the last 15 years if I trusted the MFT, really zero. They would have predicted zero of anything. I, I would not have looked at itrobium rhodium to silicon to not at any of the heavy fermion compounds because they all look. But that's because you forgot to add the U. They, we ought to talk about. Yeah, DFT, it's not DFT enough DFT to just U. add the U. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, it's I, so hard I, for theory. Come on. I, I am. I am saying that some some cases can 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 work, but one okay. has. To, there is always an intuition path. And Rosa yeah. Valenti would like to speak for the theorist and the DFT for you, you <laughs> Go ahead, please, Rosa. Yes, thank you. No, I, I just was uh, uh, was uh, very amused by this uh, discussion on the theories, what they can do. Um, in fact, as uh, Jay, uh, so Jim was already mentioning, there have been and there are quite a lot of efforts to try to um, predict some materials. And indeed, uh, Silke was saying that if we are in the case that the systems are not very correlated, then predictions are rather good. And we let's look at all these uh, band topology and all these topological materials that have been predicted. Some of them have, have worked. The problem is when correlations are an issue, then it becomes extremely complicated. And the effort of that uh, Gabi Kodlia did, I mean, this is, was a huge effort and I think they had some successes, but as soon as we have correlations, things become complicated um, and much more complex to deal with, but we are not giving, giving up. I think that um, one has to continue trying. And I also, uh, I am of the idea that using machine learning is a helpful tool, not only for searching now materials, but also for using it for our methods to solve uh, the equations we need to solve to do some prediction. So um, material, so all this machine learning is useful in many aspects. So I am rather optimistic. I'm not saying that we are going to find tomorrow something new, but I think we should go on trying. This was what I wanted to say. <laughs> it's obvious that these are tools, uh, as as experiments are to, tools as well, and exactly. it's it's reasonable to think that. Uh, well, I, 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 we are entering the the constant debate of uh, of uh, of uh, <laughs> randomness and. Uh, uh, hazard uh, in in uh, the, in Henri, the, if I can interrupt because we don't have much time uh, I'd okay. like to hear from uh, uh, from Warren uh, Pickett who's going to tell us a bit about the hydrides okay yes I can just elaborate a little bit on what Henri said a while ago about the hydrides uh, in the transition uh, sorry in the metal hydrides at high pressure uh, what's what's important is that we have a really well-founded theory of superconductivity from electron phone uncoupling. And the software that's available, been developed the last 20 years, is tremendous. And in fact, the 200 Kelvin superconductor was predicted before it was uh, confirmed experimentally. The 250 or 60 degree lanthanum hydride, also calculated first and then and confirmed experimentally. And also the yttrium hydride, again, those three, uh, and they're all around two megabars pressure. But uh, where you have a theory that works very well for the property that you're looking for, yeah. uh, computation uh, in several areas, like in ferroelectrics and so forth, has progressed to the level 
where yes, it's, it's efficient to do the calculations first. Uh, even expensive calculations might take three weeks or something, but for an experimentalist to set up uh, and do a new sample in a diamond anvil cell might take two or three months. Um, when you're talking about heavy fermion superconductivity, um, I think there's no agreement on what you should, there's certainly no quantitative theory. There's no agreement on what you should look for to try to find a new superconductor or a new antiferromagnetic superconductor or, or whatever. Um, so it, uh, it's still the case that maybe if you had a database of 100,000 uh, prospective heavy fermion compounds, that machine learning might recognize something um, that we don't have any theory for, but we don't have any database like that. So um, that's, that's a drawback to discovering new materials with machine learning. There are some advances being made apparently uh, by various groups. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Warren. Uh, before you, Andre, let me ask Lucian to talk about EDMFT. Uh, Lucian. Hi, thank you. So what I wanted to say, I spent a few years at Radgas with Christian and Gabi Kotli are working on materials. And my focus was mostly on trying to get the property, see what's happening. And what I want to say is not easy at all, even using theory, even though it seems easy, you do the simulation, look at the properties, it's a lot of calculation involved. There are so many parameters you can vary and it takes a lot of time for materials to know. Working materials who don't know anything about it's hard. What one can do if you have some hints from experiments, uh, resistivity or some properties, then you can go around those. But until you get to that point, you have to get the material. So it's still a lot of time invested in getting the material. But I said, six years I spent and from hundreds of materials where I tried, maybe 10% were successful and I got some results, but a lot of work. So it's not that easy, even with theory, at least in the dynamic and infield theory where calculations are very expensive. So that's what I wanted to say that it's hard to search in the phase space for new materials using these tools, which, which takes a lot of computational time. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Lucien. Andre, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, um, I wanted to make two two separate remarks. One in answering uh, Nick's uh, question, for instance, why does, uh, I think it was scandium copper oxide doesn't exist, right? Um, so there is one question which is more along these lines and it may be more relevant to what Zilke and J JP were saying. That is, how do you know whether the material would even exist and, and what structure might it have? I'm not an expert on this at all. I know there are some attempts, one of them by uh, Chris P. Card, I forgot if he's UCL or Imperial College London. Um, he has this idea of the stochastic um, exploration of the materials, where essentially you say, well, I um, have this many scandium atoms, this many copper and oxygen, I'm gonna throw them in the box. I have no clue what crystal structure is gonna be, what space group is gonna be. I'm just gonna chemistry do its magic. You model, of course, with some approximation, in his case, level of the DFT. So take it for granted that yes, there may be, um, you know, it's not perfect world. And he can predict whether the structure would be even stable, for instance, right? Sometimes you get trapped in a potential minima, but the long story short, that's one approach, which is more along the lines of what pharmaceutical companies take, right? It's more expensive to synthesize a drug and test it. It's more efficient to do DFT. And usually it requires high throughput. And based on what Luciana is saying, even without plugging in DMFT, you need both the machine and manpower and dedicated people who want to do that. Right? So that's one point. The other is more along the lines of exploration for new properties. And this is what Lucian was talking about. And what I guess Pierce, you, um, you hinted at when you said, well, we want to find perhaps a new heavy fermion superconductor or a material that has a property X. So now it's not a question of whether scandium, if you combine with copper and oxygen exists, the question is even broader. Well, where in the periodic table should I look at? Should I look at maybe the existing materials? So there are some attempts to try and do that, use uh, high throughput calculations to just try and see what happens. So um, Warren, you mentioned that there are ways how if you assume that the superconductivity comes from electron phonon coupling, you could try and predict TC. 
So one of the pioneers to try to do it from DFT level is um, Hardy Gross. Uh, he's at Max Planck Institute in Halle. Um, and so, you know, his approach is basically this, you know, high throughput calculation, you know, you give me, you know, maybe a thousand materials you're interested in, I'm going to run DFT. That's assuming the structures are known, right? The materials exist. I'm going to run DFT. I'm going to tell you what TC is with reasonable assumptions for what mu star is, or oh, sorry, yeah, mu star, the, the effective interaction parameter. Of course, it's based on some Macmillan type formula. It's not perfect, but it gives you an idea, right? And so I, I guess I would like to conclude by saying that there are these two somewhat different questions that seem to be around. One, can we use predictive power of calculations and maybe machine learning to find out whether a new material might exist, like scandium oxygen combined with copper? And the other one, well, given a thousand possibilities of these materials in a periodic table, which of them might be a new heavy fermion superconductor? And that's what more Lucian talking talked about. And the second problem is arguably equally hard or harder because the theoretical underpinning is less developed. I should stop here. Zilka. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm pessimistic. I'm, even if I tell everything I know about the terbium rhodium to silicon to, <laughs> currently, no theorist, ab initio based theory would ever tell me it's superconducting. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's what I said I mean, about the lack of the I can give everything. I can give TC, DC, structure, well, everything. Yeah. It's impossible. <laughs> Right, but that, that's my point that we don't know the theoretical. But I mean, we are up to exciting new physics, right? I think, I think if you go like that, you are almost certain you will not discover. No, because you have a clear target no. what you want the theory to predict. And <laughs> it, it can't do it in a new setting. I, I don't, I'm very pessimistic about that. Sorry. The theory say that ytterbium rhodium 2 silicon 2 is interesting, perhaps not not for superconductivity, but just interesting that it has a large- No, they would find it totally boring. Why would they find it interesting? I, yeah, but but so, but maybe, maybe um, these high throughput ideas are good for exploring as, as we as as we heard from Rosa, maybe they're good for technological applications, uh, improving the quality of a thermoelectric compound, or or uh, things in which we understand the physics fairly well. Maybe they'll be useful in that context. And perhaps the hope is that as the machine learning gets better and the physics gets better, we'll be able to do more of that. Um, but uh, yeah. Okay, Lucian. Yeah, I think you have to... to start much less challenging. Say to, oh, I want to discover the, the, the totally new property. I think that's really- I think you need to know the rules that govern things. Look, at some level, we do know the rules. It's Schrodinger's equation, but that's not helpful enough. Um, in AlphaGo, they know the rules and they've been able to have computers teach each other. And I'm told that some Go players actually use the computers now to improve their strategy. So that's a counter example of where it really has worked well. Um, so I look forward to the day when, when I can talk to a computer and it can say, well, Piers, you might want to think about this concept. It's really going to help you along your way. Um, we're not there yet. Um, uh, Lucian, you had your hand up first. I'm, you're next. Yeah, so what I say, I agree perfectly with what Andre said, but also what you said, I think numerical tools, especially if you know the compound and you want to improve properties, you work a little bit, I mean, sometime on the compound, you establish all the rules of the, let's say, game, and then you can improve. For that, it works. But to discover new things, I think, is very hard. From my eight years' experience using EDMFT or dynamic MFT theory. So if you know, you can improve, but to discover new things is really hard. That's what. And I have hundreds of examples where things failed, which I never, I could not publish or Give us one anybody example about of a that. failure. Tell us one failure. No, but you have some compound, some property, and then you go and say, you know what, if this structure works, you see the structure is not stable. You find some crystal structure, you do the calculation, you get a nice insulator theory experiment comes with metal. You know, you go in advance and you improve and you're happy that you got it. By the time you want to publish, some experiment comes and everything you did is gone. <laughs> so, and then, the, you know, what you could do, try to publish as fast as possible, even if it's not 
<laughs> true you don't know it's not you published it then if some experiment comes and say it's not correct well that's what the theory gave me so it's not easy at all to be honest and then coming up or based on what you discussed that you know when you're young and you need publication grants it's hard to try to discover new things you always try to improve something in the positive direction to get some funding or to yeah it's the frustrating the hard life yes uh daniel you're next uh, yeah, I, I thought Rosa made a, uh, she made a, a very important point that, that, you know, one of the rare cases where theory has been leading experiment was in, in is materials with topological band structures. And of course, those are, you know, largely understood from a non-interacting point of view and so are particularly simple and presumably, you know, they're robust to whatever interactions that, that may, may, may exist in, in materials that have been found. But I remember there's a paper about 15 years ago by Yao Tsai and Kivelson where they looked at a, at, a, at, a, at a solvable limit of a checkerboard Hubbard model and they found this just uh, incredible diversity of, of phases where you know, they had phase separation, Fermi liquid, anti-ferromagnet, you know, D-wave, superconductor, mod insulator, you know, the CDW. And I'm just wondering whether I mean, could it just be in some sense that, you know, nature is against us, you know, when you, when you put in, when you put in interactions, there's, there's just such a, a complicated, uh, you know, phase diagram that the idea that, that we could sort of, you know, pinpoint, you know, any, any phase, you know, theoretically is, is, is really uh, um, uh, is sort of unreasonable expectation and, and, and that, uh, you know, experimentalists may, may, may find, <laughs> find new phases by more or less by accident or intuition. Uh, before I let Tim make a comment, I want to point out that the ancient mariners had a principle that there was so much continent at the north, in the northern hemisphere, that it must be something in the south that would balance it. Uh, and so they actually looked for this and they discovered Australia. So sometimes it works. Tim, your question. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Um, I, I think these uh, points about how to plan out a path through this like materials phase space are important. That's sort of what we've been discussing for a little bit and what how to choose the direction and what materials to look at. Uh, I was going to take us back to the publication or to the um, uh, incentive structure, the funding structures, and because and, to me that I think is the largest impedance to this uh, this journey, um, regardless of what path we take, and. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think uh, the most important thing I think is for um, scientists uh, to, uh, you know, pressure the funding agencies and the universities to change the way they fund um, and, and, and to come up with new ideas for how to, to fund science. Um, you know, I, I don't have a, a, a neat idea myself, but just an example would be like, you fund a, uh, I don't know how different this is to how it currently is, but you fund, say, uh, a, a specific type of, of, uh, of uh, class of materials or, uh, you know, condo insulators or something. And you say, okay, this is, you know, there's uh, any professor that does this research, you know, can have $100,000, $200,000 for, um, you know, the same amount for anybody that, that, qualifies as this is this um uh for that type of science and then it just goes out to everybody and then <clears throat> that's doing that science um and then the publication system of of uh i think having um the the sort of the the way the uh the secrets come that were mentioned and the publication bias um i think uh, those could be sort of uh potentially improved by having you know, this idea of this archive like website where people can put up kind of incomplete uh, work. Um, you know, uh, uh, perhaps you can have experimentalists that just focus on, uh, you know, having really high quality data, putting it up for whoever, you know, all the theorists, anybody, it's public, can go and look. And then the theorists, you know, different theorists can see it and, and they can start um, uploading their little explan uh, explanations and pe uh, different people can do analysis and so forth um but yeah that's that's my point of view Tim, where do you work just wanted to hear that oh uh john hopkins okay great okay good hanka your hand is up 
Yeah, I just wanted to add something. I mean, about the experience Lucian was saying, but before that, I wanted to ask a question of experimentalists. Uh, I'm sort of new at this precision many body as it's called DFT and EDMFT. And I work together with Lucian and Christian Howley. But my experience is that even if uh, one is able to predict, I guess one thing one could do is predict if certain compounds are stable, uh, theoretically. If that is, is that interesting by itself to the experimentalist? or they would want to know more, just that a compound is stable. I think that's not enough, right? And that's one thing this precision many body calculations can do. The other thing is I want to reiterate, these calculations are very computer intensive and time consuming. And I've been working on a couple of projects with these guys and I keep telling them how frustrated that it takes too long. So it does take a long time to do a really good self-consistent EDMFT calculation. And, and if you want to be really thorough, so that's another factor. Then finally, I want to say, I mean, the computational resources, I think this is one thing where we should really look to see if we can really make an inroad into providing huge computational resources to people who want to do these first principle calculations. Only a few major groups have the huge resources. It's not widely available. And even if you have ideas, it's not easy. I come from a smaller group. I have to rely on large groups having large computational resources to be able to even, even if I have a good idea. Mm -hmm. And I'm, for example, I'm at the blessing of the Rutgers group that I'm able to do this calculation. So uh, that's another thing. The computational resources are not widely available uh, to, um, to groups which are of modest size. Um, so those are my comments. And I think I like the idea of putting things on archive. If experimentalists, even the failures could be, and I think Pierce had it in his slide and Tim just mentioned, if there were archives, which showed even the failures, maybe theorists can look into some of those and have guidance. I think having a materials archive is a great idea, uh, whichever way, theory or experiment. Okay, I'm gonna have to, that was a great comment. I think we had a really good discussion. There's a lot more people we could have heard from uh, who I see down there be keeping very quiet. I would have loved to have heard from you all, but uh, we're now gonna hand over to Daniel, who is session chair for the next session, which will be Rosa Valenti. Over to you, Daniel. Okay, uh, thank you, Piers. 